Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, a podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm an investigative journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are economists, scientists, politicians, academics and activists, to name a few. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic and ecological crises that we face today. And they reveal their solutions to mitigate the damage to our future. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. This week's guest is Jason Bradford, a biologist who spent his career studying food systems and recently set up his own farm in order to teach his children how to farm, and to teach his community how to farm, and to also study on the ground how we can make more rural food systems, which he says will provide for a better future. Jason also has a YouTube channel, which he uses to teach people how to farm, which after speaking with him, I'm now absolutely convinced we, we all need to do um, um, because, you know, he says that food production is going to be the, the number one important thing um, in the coming decade, essentially. Jason goes into detail about why he came to this conclusion and actually probably more importantly, the great joy that he has found in farming, in being outside every day, in eating that which he produces, in having a closer relationship with the natural world, in seeing the enjoyment that his children take from it. There is a great message of hope in what Jason has to say. I think there's a great message of hope in what many of my guests have to say. I hope there's hope. <laughs> because ultimately he's describing how life is going to be or could be, yes, simpler in many ways that may be uncomfortable, but how much joy there is to be found in that simplification purely by nurturing our relationships with each other and a communion with nature. So I find this a really, really beautiful interview, even though I remember finishing it and thinking immediately, right, well, that's it. We've, we've all got to move to Wales to learn how to farm. Why Wales? Well, you'll hear later on in the show. I hope you enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. If you love it, do consider supporting Planet Critical on Patreon, where you'll find public bonus episodes of my thoughts on each interview. The Patreon link is in the description box below, and thank you so much to everyone who is already supporting the project. This work just wouldn't be happening without you. Alice introduced you to me as a leader in peak oil and limits to growth when I interviewed her. But I was reading through today your report, The Future is Rural. And I haven't had anybody on the show talk about food yet and what it will look like as energy sources decline. And so I would love to cover that today. Yeah, that's what I do. That's what you do. <laughs> I don't do much else. <laughs> Brilliant. So if you could just kind of introduce um, your work and we'll go from there. Right now, I'm, I'm mostly a farmer. I, uh, I live outside of Corvallis, Oregon with my family and we've been fortunate enough to get some really nice farmland next to our house. So uh, incredible rich soil and an amazing climate. And I partnered with um, this other group that's been around for a while that has a CSA called Community Supported Agriculture. So we get this a subscription service and we mostly give our customers bo weekly boxes of you know quality vegetables and fruits these sort of things so that's kind of my day-to-day -day stuff and um but going back a ways i was a research biologist and really into um history of life sort of evolution and ecology work uh, biodiversity and rainforest this sort of stuff kind of um faded away from academia and um for kind of personal and just the difficulty of of having a, a toddlers and a wife who was a busy physician. And so I was able to kind of step back and decided I was going to try to learn how to farm. And I'm very interested in, you know, I've traveled around the world quite a bit for my research, and I always would go through rural hinterlands. And I became very interested in sort of, well, how are people getting by here? You know, mm -hmm. what is it they're growing? Food systems differ so much all over the world. So I had my eye out for this. No matter where I went, I was in Madagascar and I saw people like planting rice and 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 harvesting vanilla beans. Um, South America, potatoes in the Andes. I went to Malaysia and just had this incredible different food. Um, had durians, you know, a South Pacific taro. So it's been fascinating to see this. 
And, uh, and so when I started like researching kind of what would call, what was called global change science, and this would be like nineties, early, early two thousands and integrating it into my research, I really became aware that, you know, there was quite a, quite a bizarre situation with, with humans in which unlike most creatures, we were not, we were not living anymore in a food system that was a net energy positive system. So I'm not sure if folks are familiar with that kind of concept, but I can expand on that if possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be great. Okay. So if you were like, uh, if you were to go out as a, you know, wake up in the morning as an animal, say a raccoon, and um, or wake up in the evening as a raccoon, which is a nocturnal <laughs> mammal, <laughs> um, you would go out and forage. And if you're in a city, you would, you know, dumpster dive. But if you're in the... You, if you're in the rural areas or forests, you go out and you try to find fruits and mushrooms and nuts or whatever you're going to sort of scrap for. And you, you're you hoping you're going you're gonna to spend less calories going out and foraging than it took you to do that foraging. In other words, you've got, you got energy climbing, dipping down trees, scrambling around, sniffing, chewing, digesting. There's a baseline energy need you have. And then there's the effort it takes to get food. And mm -hmm. you better get more f more food energy back than you expended, or you're going to like wither away and die, right? And so that's the way kind of natural systems work. There always has to be an energy gain um, when when you're when you're sourcing your food, um, or you know your population declines, individuals start to die off. And what's bizarre about humans is we set up a system where it's completely backwards. We basically expend way more energy uh, growing and distributing and preparing our food than that is in the food itself. Sorry, just to stop there, but that is, is that since uh, the Industrial Revolution and the introduction of industrial farming? And is it specific to certain parts of the world, I would assume the industrialized world? It's It's the most extreme in the industrialized world, yes. And that's okay. that's right. And so, of course, anthropologists and sociologists can, can look at food systems in the past and make inferences on their energy inputs to outputs. And you can look at examples today that go study a hunter-gatherer society or uh, a pretty remote agrarian society and do the work, just add it up. And there's mm -hmm. actually been experiments in the U.S. where, you know, uh, professors at universities have tried to recreate these agrarian systems and done the math on, okay, with hand tools or with oxen, how much effort do we put out and how much do we get back in our potatoes and our corn, et cetera. And all those, all those more primitive sort of systems, non-industrialized, um, they have a, they have an energy, positive energy return. And right. as soon as you start getting into the synthetic fertilizers and the big tractors covering all these acres and um, high energy processing systems for packaging and press freezing and freeze drying and shipping it around the globe and putting it on those supermarket shelves that uh, have an overhead of that building and and then driving to and fro and then putting it in your fridge and then turning on your stove and you mm. add this all up and it's just like a major energy sink. So that's, that has been one of my major concerns is if you look at the fact that that whole thing is basically subsidized by fossil fuels um, and fossil fuels we know were created over a sort of relatively brief geological epoch and magically preserved for us for millions of years until we figured out what to do with them. And they're, they're fossils, so they only, you, you can bust them once and then it's over. Mm -hmm. You just think to yourself, gosh, what have we done? <laughs> so that's kind of been my journey from an academic to then saying, okay, how do, I, how do I farm in a way that maybe tries to provide a net energy return again? This is so interesting because food is something that comes up a lot in the climate talks, mostly because of methane and the emissions of um, producing certain foods, really often livestock. Um, and obviously fossil fuels, we tend to think about um, transport and and the more um, obvious use of the word fuel. Yeah. But 
we never really think about all these different steps of the amount of energy yeah it takes to get food on the table and that i've never heard somebody say that like our food systems are an energy sink before mm -hmm. and that is terrifying when you have a a, a globe mm, global is probably a, too much of a westernized stretch but when you have masses amounts of the population all around the world that have lost the knowledge of farming or living in an agrarian society and are dependent on fossil fuels which are we've peaked happened in 2018 yep. we're gonna yep. have to figure out a new way to do it no amount of renewables are ever going to produce the same system that we have right. what are we going to do yeah uh i don't know that's what i struggle with what are we going to do <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of this is a cultural problem like you're like you're getting at it's it's sort of you go so far down the path of creating economic systems that are based upon mostly an urbanized population that is a system that, that they're consumers and it's pretty easy for them to go shopping. Uh, trucks trucks carry goods in and, and carry waste out. And there's a whole sort of set of sort of what we call tertiary jobs. So if you were to think of ecosystems, you've got primary productivity, which it would be plants. And, mm -hmm. and then because they capture sunlight and store that store the energy of sunlight into starches and proteins and fats. And then you've got secondary levels, which are like the herbivores. So they can graze. They're, they're, they're directly connected to that primary productivity level. And then you've got tertiary, and those are like the carnivores. And mm -hmm. of course, in ecosystems, there's always more plant plant productivity than there are herbivores than there are carnivores. There's a loss. There's entro entropic loss. You always have, you can't have more carnivores on, uh, in these ecosystems, these terrestrial ecosystems, than you have plant biomass. It doesn't add up. Mm. And so something weird happened to our economy. What we did was because we were no longer tied to the, to the energy requirements of land bases, we had this fossil fuel subsidy. We were able to flip it where now we are, able, we are able to shove the workforce into the tertiary sector, mm -hmm. which normally would be rare. Like it was rare to have so many attorneys and so many life coaches and so many musicians and so many bankers. Society couldn't really support those many people in those tertiary sectors of the economy. Most people had to be down at the primary level, which for an animal like us is sort of harvesting, harvesting biomass and then improving on that biomass, making higher quality, which you might consider the secondary. So you, you might take raw, raw fiber or raw food products and then do something with them, make cloth, okay, uh, leather. So there's someone like managing the cows and then there's someone making leather goods. And then there's somebody who's maybe an accountant <laughs> that helps, helps with all that or a priest okay, or, you know, a circus performer. But there's way fewer of those priests and accountants and circus performers, okay, than there were farmers and sort of, you know, the trades, the trades people, the crafts people. Mm -hmm. And we flipped that script in the industrialized world. And so now, you know, in the United States, what do they say, 1% of the workforce are farmers? Yeah. And um, so that's a pretty bizarre situation. And that you know, when I, when I, what I say is like run from the tertiary economy. If you are in the tertiary economy, flee that, go secondary, go primary, get into those other sectors where you are not, you are useful with, uh, without, when there's not that super high energy subsidy. And that's not easy. I know it's, it's <laughs> no, it's not easy. It's also, it goes against that same cultural script, which is that development um, allows for freedom for people to explore what they need or what they want to do rather than what they need to do. Yeah. Um, so, and I think that this is a lot of the issue with, um, with hammering home a, a climate message that people can get on board to, because right now, if you think of kind of, okay, well, you need to flee the tertiary economy. You need to be useful in some sense when, you know, we really start to run out of fossil fuels. To many folk, that means sort of slipping back into a dark age. We had our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, uh, mm -hmm. warn at, um, where was he at? He was at that uh, big G7 meeting in Italy before COP26. He was on national television 
warning against the dark ages. You know, so how, yeah, right? The, a politician would kind of use that sort of language. <laughs> yeah. He's such a drama queen. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good hair, though. <laughs> but how do we kind of sell that message? How, right. What do we do to that narrative to make it more appealing to people? That, like, okay, no, you yeah. might not get to be able to be a musician, but, you know, maybe you'll have a more community-led life or you'll have a better right. relationship to your land and to your, your history. Yeah, and I would say be a musician, but don't don't be a prof- don't necessarily be, it, it, count on being a professional musician. Count on right. being the person that when you sit around in the evening is great at guitar and, or has a wonderful voice, and mm. the people around you appreciate it. That's probably still good. That's probably good enough. <laughs> I hope mm. for most people. So I think mm. a lot of these creative things are wonderful, and I don't think we should give up on them. I just don't think that as many people are going to be, you know having these careers where they get on Spotify and they take off. Um, But, you know, what's interesting is a lot of, I think, our mental health problems in this, in the, in so-called developed world are because we kind of deep down know how pathetic most of us are and related to being able to to provision for their basic needs in life. Mm. That's, and and then we also have a lot of you know social isolation, and we we're, we're not we're not sure how good our relationships really are. We're a mobile society. There's a lot of shallowness. You know, you can easily you can easily get find new people. You've got apps you can find new people, but you can also ghost them. And so and then families have become so disconnected too. People have decided for professional reasons they can move to the other side of the world, and okay, I can always fly home, baby, but eh, you know. Um, so I think there's a, there's a hunger to be connected to things that are real and to things that are beautiful and to things that provide a sense of security, but you know, not in the sense of a bunker mentality, but in a sense that I have, I have skill sets, I have knowledge that is comforting to me and that I can share and and others can work with me to learn more and more, and it could, it could ramp up where we get more and more people who are good at these kind of things. And that, that provides a sense of security and connection. And working next to each other, you know, working side by side with people on doing, doing these sort of basic, basic things that are important is really rewarding and comforting. I have a mm. lot of students that come out from the university, and they're, they're you know, late teens, early 20s. And we have a blast and we're working, we're planting and weeding and harvesting and, but it's often beautiful and it's the earth smells good and the food tastes great and you can snack on that right there in the field. Mm. So the joy I see in the people that are just working hard, but doing something really useful and learning and they're just soaking up the information because they didn't grow up in some rural Romanian village where they knew how to milk cows and grow the best beets in the world um, from from being a toddler. They mm-hmm. they're they're coming and they're going. Wow, this is what I want to do. But they're you know they're 19 years old when they figure that out. But let's crunch some numbers though with that vision. I mean, is there enough farmland now in the USA or in the UK, Europe to support entire populations if they're doing it themselves without these industrial fertilizers or mm-hmm. machines or without fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah. Well, in some places there is, in some places it's it's a stretch. You know, obviously Singapore can't do this. Um, mm. The US could. UK apparently, you know, the Soil Association there crunches numbers like this. The UK apparently could. But yeah, it would require a wholesale reorganization of, like I said, you know, the tertiary, there wouldn't be so much, you know, London would not be the center of economic activity. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You know, it's more like you distribute it across the landscape. So how that happens is a real conundrum. Um, And there are people thinking about it from the sociological perspective, from land reform perspective, but um, it probably takes a series of crises before this kind of stuff gets, you know, a lot of attention from, from Boris, Boris Johnson. Mm. The, the Wales has done a lot. Wales has done a lot. Really? Yeah. 
So look, look, look to Wales. Uh, they have some really interesting laws and um, systems where people are allowed to go onto the land. So, it's, so it's right, you know, a lot of the way land use laws work is they try to discourage rural habitation. Because yeah. what they don't want is they don't want rich people basically putting up little mansion houses and then mm-hmm. and then driving you know their Land Rovers forty miles to the nearest store, and that's polluting and it's it drives up land prices which are already astronomical in many places, and so they want to kind of keep farmland for farmers, but mm-hmm. the problem is hardly the farmers hardly are hardly any doing anything related to what we're talking about, which requires repopulating the countryside, which goes against a lot of what people in kind of the green movement think is a smart thing to do. So Why? I think there's a- Why do they not think that's a smart thing to do? Well, there's a lot of, of saying like, well, you know, if, if you pack people into towns and cities, then you can provide goods and services with less transportation costs. And transportation is a big thing. And, mm-hmm. and, and so there's, there's, you know, there's probably a schism in in environmental circles related to this this idea. One idea is, you know, you separate people from the natural world and for the means of production, and you become efficient at, at distribution. And you can, you know, and then the other is, no, you reintegrate people back into landscapes, but have them do so in an ecologically sensitive way. And they're mostly doing local provisioning. And these are two different, completely different perspectives on on how we should deal with our sort of predicament or existential crisis mm. and but the green the popular green movement say is more about keeping the the population urban in order to better provide them with whatever they need yeah that's very right. common that's that's a very typical sort of uh, western environmental perspective right. and i think it stems quite a bit from you know, believing fully in sort of modernism mm. and being blind to the energy underpinnings of mo- of modernism. Mm, mm. And not understanding the myth of efficiency as well. Exactly. The more efficient you make something, the more the economy grows. Yeah. Or also it's called, it's about the boundary of analysis of this efficiency. I mean, sure, garbage, you know, refuse service and food delivery service is much more efficient at the final mile in a city. But yeah. they're not thinking beyond, wait a second, how do we make people less dependent on actually buying anything, that, buying the stuff they need? Yeah. That is too radical a step because getting rid of sort of the monetary basis of, of livelihood or reducing that as much as possible is not a strategy that anybody in power even will conceive of, mm-hmm. right? So this gets to more like how were peasant societies organized, right? They didn't need any, they they needed hardly any money. Mm -hmm. Um, Nowadays, farmers don't grow any food for themselves in most parts, in in many parts of the industrialized world. They grow food for the commodity markets, they get paid cash, and they go to the supermarket. In in the old days, you were mostly growing food for your family, and then you would have excess, or you would focus on something high value that would be your cash crop, and that's what you'd use to pay taxes and buy other goods, etc., Mm-hmm. And and so it's co- it's a complete flip. It, uh, there's um, most of what we need to do now is the opposite of what we've been doing for the last you know 150 years. And so most of the time, that's that's what's the opposite of what we've been doing. That's likely going to be a better response. Whereas what we tend to be doing is doubling down mm. on sort of the the myth of progress and sort of the the modern perspective on how mm-hmm. people should inhabit the planet. Mm-hmm. Just to play devil's advocate, um, wouldn't uh, wouldn't that initial shift to more rural, localized farming communities um, cause a lot of deaths initially? Surely there would be a huge loss of lives in the transition. Yeah, kind of uh, help me understand where you're coming from with that. Well, okay. Say we take what you just said, that we're continuing to double down consistently on modernity. And that mm-hmm. it's probably going to take a couple of crises to shift our society in a different direction. Surely that will mean at sort of the peak of these crises. Um, there won't be like a plan in place or a strategy in place. It's going to be a reaction uh, mm-hmm. to the necessity to feed oneself. And that shift um, as people leave urban 
as especially as urbanites leave the centers to go to the more rural areas without the adequate knowledge to feed themselves. Right. right. And also with the loss of industry that will then come, you know, we will have less doctors and we will have less scientists and we will have less of, you know, there is parts of progress that are fantastic. Yeah, um, I, I you know. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, surely we're going to, we are going to see lo huge losses of lives. Yeah. Oh, I mean, if I had my druthers, you know, there would be some sort of technocrat light plans being formed. Hmm. You have to balance the the need to sort of centralize and plan with the need to also let people go and figure stuff out, and mm -hmm. and the and the ability to also then fail gracefully. So we need kind of backup. In other words, like I I I would be I would be hopeful there would be sort of a you know like a a, a forty year plan where you're you're redistributing populations and doing training and giving subsidies. That would be the smart way to do it, okay? Right, um, and re reconfiguring education systems around this, because um, we we way overproduce food right now, and yeah. we can probably still way overproduce food for quite a while if we accept some natural gas use, some diesel use, mm -hmm. some you know keep some of the big tractors going, um, and then you just sort of like piece by piece ramp that system down while you're ramping something uh, some, an alternative up so that that would be the smart way to go um i like i i don't think we're going to do anything smart that's what i'm upset mm. with all right because to do that just over that just basically turns over completely everyone's most people's belief system and most people's sense of identity mm -hmm. um and there's no there's there's not really money in it, so to speak. It's actually it's sort of saying let's let's phase out the the power of of capital, um, the overriding power. You know, it's not like there's no commerce and trade and money system and all that, but it becomes less important when you have a lot of people who, you know, consumer goods aren't the be all end all. And yeah. I mean, if you're focusing on energy gain rather than capital gain, there you go. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, I mean, first question then on that, do we have 40 years? That seems like <laughs> a very long time. When I, when I interview, uh, you know, the other yeah. fellow global systems change scientists, they're like, yeah, no, we've got a decade. Yeah. I, you know, that's the thing. I don't know. The, the, the problem we're getting at now is the difference between how fast social systems can change and still hold together mm -hmm. versus how fast... Earth systems are changing, and what that what that implies for what we should be doing. And so this gets into really um, difficult to topics like what kind of what kind of control our populations put under, what kind of rationing, how do they accept these sort of things? Is there a narrative mm -hmm. that allows them to accept it and not revolt? Um, do they trust the people, the institutions that are managing all this? Are the elites completely corrupt? And um, what kind of crazy conspiracy theories get pushed around? Do you are you driving, um, you know, nationalistic kind of responses, or are you are you still allowing for international cooperation in all of this? And so that you know. Part of what scares me just as much as sort of the idea of, you know, an Antarctic ice sheet collapsing or whatever is the, um, just the fact that people are so confused and people are so angry. Yeah. And, um, and part of that I think is that in many ways, the confused, angry people have a real right to be confused and angry. Unfortunately, they then tend to gravitate towards just notions that are just so outlandish but they provide sort of some simple comfort mm -hmm. and um i think it would be really nice if we could if some if some way we could find peaceful means of of transitioning and not scapegoating and blaming others and i don't know if that's going to happen honestly um but it's not going to happen if we have complete blinders on mm. and if we're not 
we're not based on some kind of biophysical reality with what we're doing. I, you know, I would say I don't think there's there are masters in control of the of the global economy. I think it's it's a system that evolved, and the elites have taken advantage of it, and mm -hmm. they've over enriched themselves. And it's leading to a lot of stability, but I also don't think that you know there's some grand plan afoot. I think it's a little cha it's quite chaotic, mm -hmm. and that in itself is scary. It's easier to believe that there are lizard people, you know, or the Illuminati <laughs> that have some kind of control. <laughs> and if only yeah. you could like, you know, get yeah. rid of them and install yeah. your people who would yeah. gain a sense, get control back. Well, then we can yeah. solve this stuff. Yeah. That is comforting in some ways. Yeah. And it also removes a, a burden of personal responsibility. Absolutely. So what I'm saying is harder in a sense, it's like, no, nobody really has a has a hold on this. They're all faking it. Mm. You know, the leaders of the world are faking it and mm. they're good at that. That's why they're Machiavellian narcissistic personality types. Mm -hmm. um, but what we really need to do to feel a little bit better <laughs> and is to gain some sense of of competency over basic provisioning. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, then maybe your 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 mental health will allow you to kind of like start accepting other things and not be and not be as angry. You might be sad. Sadness is a much healthier emotion than anger in this situation, I think. Mm, that's interesting. I think that the the problem there is twofold. It's that we must all take more personal responsibility um for the future that we want to create. And I also, I, I really believe that um, most people born into a certain situation or environment would probably be the same as whatever, you know, elite that they hate. It's, you know, we're not all that special. We are mostly products of our social conditioning. That said, um, the amount of disinformation that is out there, um, the amount of deliberate confusion, obfuscation, uh, it seems to me uh, very often to be certain groups of elite capitalists still just trying to make a profit, a profit, a profit, a profit. I mean, you hear about, you know, destabilization in the Middle East happening purely because, you know, some very dangerous bloke wants to get his hands on um, a mine in the middle of yeah. it, you know. And in fact, there is there is a guy that came out and he said uh, in an interview on the record that the best way to engender profits was political destabilization. So that's kind of what he's committed to. It works up to a point and then it all goes to shit. This is so amazing. Yeah. Like these people are like, they don't have any long-term plan. They just yeah. are living in the moment, trying to like squeeze out profits and power. Yeah. And God, it'd be just, we need to run as far away from those folks as we absolutely can. And it's hard though. It's hard because we're getting trapped in these, a lot of people are getting trapped in these like scapegoating narratives. Yeah. And, um, that is frightening. You know, I don't want to see a, a Yugoslavia type situation happen mm -hmm. all over the world, which is what mm -hmm. I fear. Mm -hmm. Yep, 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 yep. So what, what can people do then? Um, what, and what should people in urban centers, because I mean, imagine most of my listeners, imagine, hey guys, most of you are living in urban, urban centers. Yep. What can we do? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the really big cities are kind of are kind of going to be a mess. Um, mm. Can you do you have friends or family that are in small towns or the countryside? Um, can you find your way? You know, even in the age of internet, can you can you can you find a way to maybe keep your current work but work somewhere else um, that's more rural and start to get integrated into the community and then sort of on the side, start learning some stuff, <laughs> helping mm. people out. So, you know, like you say, it's hard because all these transitions take time. And right now the, it's the, the economy demands you make money um, to, to keep a roof over your head. And yeah. a lot of that is in the tertiary economy. Yeah. Um, so how do, you, how do you hedge? How do you spend your time when you're not making money doing this other stuff? Um, Hard to do in a big city, honestly. So just leave. <laughs> leave the big city. <laughs> Find some land. 
<laughs> yeah. And it doesn't have to be, you know, you have to own it, but God, there's plenty of people that need help on their land, you know, learn how to put in hedgerows for God's sake. And there's mm. plenty of jobs with that right now in the UK, apparently okay. and stuff like that. Just improving the, proving the countryside. But you think that is definitely what people are going to have to learn to do? Yes. A lot of people. Then let's, let's segue a little bit into uh, veganism. Because veganism is touted as the way to continue with globalized food chains um, and, you know, a way to reduce emissions to the, to the extent that we can all continue to live in our industrialized economy but it's fine because there'll be no methane emissions is that is that nonsense <laughs> well you know you can see how people will come to that conclusion um it's it's a very logical it's a very logical conclusion to come to we should really push you know vegetarianism all the way to veganism but you're right it does it does presume that you have a globalized economy and highly industrialized processes for for all these food inputs, you know, and I mean, it's possible you can be a vegan and live mostly locally. And then every once in a while have to like take a, take a vitamin pill to, or to get, mm -hmm. you know, certain fatty acids and stuff. Um, but really what it is, is, is it, again, it is tied to this sort of modern, you know, the, this, this modern ideal of um, trying to be more efficient Mm. But really, in a way, it's not because it's it's sort of where you draw the boundaries of your analysis. So veganism is it, it, it's throwing out a lot of false hope for people, and I think going in many cases in the wrong direction. But but you, I can see I can see the logic, and it's true. Like industrial meat at the scale it is, it's freaking horrific. Yeah, um, completely behind all that. But what's interesting is when you look into food systems and how they evolved, the human species has gone from, you know, hunter gatherers to agrarian communities to, to urban centers with large farms. And we've done these sort of things all over the planet. And the further away you get from the equator and the higher in elevation you go, the more humans have have evolved to rely on animals. Mm. And the reason is, is that animals are an amazing way to store excess from one season and carry it into another. Right. And they also provide the fiber and like the leather products uh, that keep us warm <laughs> um, in, in places where it's otherwise hard to, hard to live. So are you going to tell some some Mongolian herdsman who like, you know, milks yaks that they need to be vegan when they can't they can't grow arugula very easily up there mm. and much of the year is frozen. So in a sense it's like not understanding how food systems evolved, not understanding where your place is in the world and what's a normal thing to do here and being rightfully concerned about the horror show of industrial CAFO, animal agriculture, and the overproduction of grains, mm -hmm. overproduction of soy, overproduction of meat. Um, so yeah, I think learning more about being humble a bit, learning more about food systems, and also know understanding what an incredible relationship it is if you have if you have animals in your life that you care for, and. Um, this is not an it's not an exploitive kind of thing. It's more of a codependency, a co-evolution. And so, a good example I could say is like the family cow versus the industrial dairy cow. Yeah. You know, you, you can have there are dairies that have thousand head cattle, a cows in a big milk yeah. twice a day, hooked up to machines. They never leave a barn. Yeah. Hay is trucked in, poop is trucked out, put into giant lagoons. Horrible. And then there's what. I've seen in peasant societies all over the world where there's a cow that's sort of just walking around. Sometimes it's sort of tied up so it doesn't get in, the, get in the way or it's moved from one paddock to another. And that cow's got a calf on its side. Mm. They didn't take the calf away at birth, which they do at industrial dairies. 
And it's so gentle. You go up and you just like put a pail under, you wipe it up, wipe the udders, you put a pail under and you milk and you take a gallon or two and you bring it back to your family. That cow is beloved. Yeah. That cow is taken care of. And there's obviously a joy and love there between the cow and the person. And I think that's, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I'm going to go for that system. I'm going to think that's a wonderful system. And, um, you know, I don't know if some hardcore vegans would be against that even, but I think most people would be like, okay, I understand the difference here. Yes, I think so. I would hope so. Um, it's again, that thing of want versus need. You know, if you're just looking for your gingerbread latte from Starbucks, then there's so, so much alienation from where all those the pieces of that product come from. Whereas there's a kind of symbiotic relationship between man and beast when they sort of both depend on one another to, to mm -hmm. live. Uh, and there can be a beauty in that. Again, for me, it's like it's the scalability. Yes. Can every family have a cow? Um, well, you know, it's, that's a great question. I think in many ways the the system that I'm talking about or I'm envisioning is so much more efficient than the system we have, mm. and way and, and you know energy positive in a sense. Now, in some places, there's no way you need a land base that's large enough, and uh, some countries are so food de import dependent, and they're way overpopulated, and they'll never be able to feed themselves, and that that's going to be an unfathomable tragedy unfolding over the next several decades. Um, I don't know what to say about that, honestly. It scares me. But for gosh sakes, there's plenty of places that the rural areas have been depopulated. <laughs> and um, yeah, instead of, instead of people getting their milk from 5,000 herd dairy and in New Mexico, like we have these, we have these states that are just like Los Angeles gets its milk from a lot of dairies in Arizona, New Mexico, and the hay is, you know, coming from center pivots that are feeding alfalfa, yeah. alfalfa and they're depleting aquifers. And it's like, for gosh sakes, the Midwest, on the other hand, it's got plentiful rainfall and stuff grows really easily. And most of the, most of it's been depopulated except for these mm -hmm. giant industrial farms. And yeah, Millions of people could repopulate rural hinterlands in places that have rainfall and good soil. And, uh, you know, the other day I was, I was processing uh, brutabaga, fun to do, you know, harvest it out know of the field. I don't know what that is. <laughs> brutabaga is a root crop, <laughs> like a swede. Okay. And uh, it's from the Mediterranean region. It's wonderful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Swede or, you know, turnips closely related turnip. Okay. Um, Wonderful root, you know, good for this time of year, make soups out of it, roast it. But some of them are bad. They've got slug damage. They're cracked open. I just toss them to the sheep. Yeah. You know, um, you could do the same thing for pigs. Chickens love, you know, excess greens and stuff. So, you know, there's an incredible actual synergy that happens where the waste product of my veggies is going to these animals that I'm quite fond of and they're they're fun to watch and play with. And that doesn't happen on these giant farms. It just becomes a pile of, of waste that starts molding and methane starts getting emitted and maybe they learn how to make compost out of it. Um, but food processing facilities are constantly getting in trouble because they don't know what to do with all their all their waste. Giant vats of, you know, gunk and goo that's left over. A slurries mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. smells like. Mm -hmm. ugh. I don't have any of that. I, I that was actually it's funny you mentioned that. That was going to be my next question uh, because I read it in your report about the symbiotic relationship between, you know, man and beast and how there's um, certain animals that are just brilliant to have around on a small farm because they will take. They don't, they yeah. don't need to grow grain to feed animals like pigs. Right. They will just take what you give them yeah. and they're, they become part of the ecosystem of that farm. Oh my God. There's so much stuff that we, we, these humans are, we're just picky, you know, <laughs> like, ah, that one thing's a little off. It's got a bruise on it. Just feed it yeah. to the pigs. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that lot lost in the UK, they lost a lot of stuff, um, rendering plants and, you know, everyone yeah. got terrified of because of mad cow and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of sad, but that was a very good system. How many hours of work 
does it take per day to feed your family on oh. this farm system? Gosh, I've thought about this, but I haven't really worked it out, unfortunately. She stopped me. Now, here's what I, I thought about this quite a bit, actually, because I've got this CSA, right? And yeah. we've got 45 boxes we put together. And the problem is I've got all these interns that come through. They're students and they're, they're getting credit and um, they're taking a class and they're going to be here for like a quarter. And I teach them, you know, no, that's spinach. Don't pick that up. Pick the wheat out next to it. And, and um, here's how you plant. And so the problem is I'm getting all this kind of labor coming in and out. But I'm, we're growing for a lot more people than, in, than um, you know, I grew, well, I grew like 6,000 pounds of potatoes, way more than my family would need. But mm -hmm. I had a lot of help harvesting them and mm -hmm. some help weeding. And I had some mechanical help. I have this little electric tractor and stuff uh, we made. But it, it, it is kind of funny. I've thought about the fact that it's way harder for me to try to keep up with, with the, the vegetable needs of these 45 CSA boxes, which probably end up feeding 150, 200 people because they're pretty good size. Then it would be for say, okay, my household, let me just mm. focus on that. Mm. But there's also some efficiency at the scale that we're at. Whereas I can, I can make a 360 foot or 400 foot long. I can talk in, I can talk in those units, right? Because we're, mm. you're in the UK. You know what yeah. I mean by feet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I could make a long row like that and just like really effectively get my planter set up and and go. And it's it's way more rutabaga than my family would ever eat. Mm. But I can fairly efficiently get plenty of rutabaga for hundreds of people, you know. Mm. So, you know, there is a little bit of a, of efficiency that comes with us with a modest scale. And and so it, it kind of makes sense for me to help feed a lot of other people. Definitely. To, to me, it, this seems like the way to sell a post-industrial world, like the vision of what life could be like. Because right mm -hmm. now, uh, precarity is so high all over the world, but even in developed nations, which is just absurd. And you have, you know, single parents working minimum wage, wage jobs, having to work for 10 hours a day to barely be able to feed their family, barely be able right. to keep a roof over their head. So if you could say to a very disenfranchised working and increasingly middle class, hey, it's not going to be progress as we cu currently understand it, but you're going to get to work less. You're going to yeah. get to be able to spend time with your family. You're going to be able to, you know, be a musician or be a writer or be whatever. And no, you won't be in, you know, Amazon won't be shipping out your books because I see that a lot. I see, especially with like um, millennials, Gen Z a little bit as they're coming into the workforce, they are so disillusioned with with how hard they have to work and for what. Because the right. vision 100 years ago was that um, technology was going to be doing everything for us and yeah. human time <laughs> would be free time. And that's obviously not the way we're going. So could that yeah. not be something that we sell to people as a, yeah. this is a goal, this is a great goal to work towards. Less work. Yeah, in some ways it is because there's a, you know, there's a lot of work work gone into this. If you look into like the, I mean, Vicky Robin was uh, big on this. Your your money or your life, um, and the minimalist movement, mm. where they do that, they do the math, and like the automobile, for example, the personal automobile is one of the like worst investments you can make because yeah. it sits around most of the time. Okay, you may use it an hour a day, but it costs you this much. And so if you look at not just the cost to drive, but the cost of buying and how many hours you have to spend working mm -hmm. so that you can afford to then drive to work yeah you know or, or yeah. drive for a holiday now and then yeah it just is kind of absurd and mm -hmm. so there's a lot of stuff where if you if you really pare down and simplify and so a lot of this is though this is then letting go of kind of the dreams of well, what does it mean to be a member of the society what stuff do i need to yeah. have what kind of frills do i need in my life yeah. And figure out how to get your jollies in other ways. Um, it's a lot easier to do this together. It, the, the problem is the isolation. You know, I would be super happy if, if, my, if my neighbor said, hey, can I just come help you farm and I just take as much vegetables as I, as I need? I'd be like, yeah, show up. I'd rather mm. not be out there by myself mm. um, because it takes me three hours to harvest enough 
enough, you know, cauliflower and then clean it and box it. And um, I can cut that, in, if I cut that down to an hour, because there's three of us working, ah, here, have as much cauliflower as yeah. you want. Doesn't yeah. matter. So yeah. doing some of the things together is really nice. And there's definitely an, I have excess. I have so much excess mm. produce. <laughs> mm. But, you know, it's, it's uh, people aren't used to that. They're used to spending their time watching a ball game or whatever, or being on their devices. And, yeah. and so I really would like to try to get people outside more and, and, and working with me. Like I said, mm -hmm. it's beautiful out there. It's, I just spend my time in awe much of the time. When I get a chance to stand up and stretch and look at the sky and listen to some of the birds and I'm just like astonished at how beautiful the world is. And so that, yeah. that, gosh, that compensates for a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that we normally seeks gratification from, you know. I just wonder as well if it would drive social progression in a way that maybe we haven't seen before. If people only had to, if people banded together and only had to work, say, three hours a day to get the food to provide, to feed the community, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then they could spend the rest of the time debating one another, speaking with one another, discovering things, listening yeah. to music, yeah, writing, yeah. Uh, drawing, yeah. whatever. You know, I just wonder if we would start to see those same leaps in like social progression and how we think about um, human society that we've right. seen in technology, for example, which we've sunk all of our oh, capital and energy into, you know? Interesting, yeah. Mm. You know, I spend a lot of time doing other things though too. Like, you know, what's been fascinating for me is is how much more cooking I'm doing. Mm. And and so, it, yeah, it, you, you go from harvesting the food and then you're chopping it and you're figuring out meals. And But the thing is, as long as I'm not doing that by myself day after day, Sometimes I don't mind doing it by myself, listening to music. I'm just like making food for the family. But what is fun is when you have other people around you also. So that also mm. that becomes then this incredible creative endeavor. You know, your, your life centers around sort of like, how wonderful can this be, this meal be? And uh, while you're listening to music, while you're talking, you know, um, while you're cleaning. So I think a lot of this has to, does have to get down with how do you break down sort of the 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 isolation of individuals and find gather people around you who you just adore and spend time doing simple things together that's pretty much the i think the key to a happy life yeah i i would agree that's why people go camping yeah exactly, exactly. that's why it's, it's a holiday industry <laughs> <laughs> right there in front of us <laughs> yeah, yeah just spend your life camping indoors you know that attitude yeah i think we should leave it there because that is a wonderful note to end on very hopeful and very positive and very visionary i try thank you yeah i mean yeah, yeah it's it's lovely it doesn't always happen <laughs> you know <laughs> it doesn't always happen on this podcast <laughs> there's always a lot of laughter but very often it's like we're fucked oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's like Monte Python. Bring out your dead. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, my final question to you would be then, much as Alice platformed you, is there somebody you would like to platform? Maybe, you know, maybe uh, the Wales situation. Uh, look, mm. into, look into that because there's a whole set of people that were involved. So Jane Davidson is one. She was kind of key. But there's probably also people that would be interesting to follow who – who have benefited from the changes in Wales and the law. Mm. So people actually living on the land. Chris Vernon, I know him. He is down there. He's in Wales with his family. He's a climatologist. He and his wife are climatologists. And they are now, they're, they're small farmers. And they, they developed um, a property with this new law where they took like 20 hectares and they were able to get four, four households on it. And those households have to, have to basically demonstrate um, they have to come up with a plan and then to demonstrate and verify that they are living with a low enough ecological footprint and provisioning for themselves quite a bit. Wow, brilliant. So that is happening in Wales and I think it's unique in the world. Jason, it was such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you too. I'm so glad you've taken all this project on and um, yeah, let me know how it's Thank going. You. I absolutely will. Thank you. If you want to learn more about Jason's work and also how to farm, I've put links to it all in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to this channel and share the episode if you enjoyed it. 
If you loved it, support Planet Critical on Patreon, where you can also find bonus episodes of my thoughts on each interview. A huge thank you to the Planet Critical supporters. This work just wouldn't be happening without you. Thank you all for listening. See you next week.